Welcome to the On Wonder podcast. We're in series five, talking about vision. I'm Sarah Kinsella. And I'm Brenda Del Monte. And today we're joined by Emma Packard and Kathy Scoggin. Welcome, you guys. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Uh, Emma has degrees in special education, emphasizing teaching students with low vision and deaf blindness. And she now serves as a teacher of students with low vision and blindness, as well as an orientation and mobility specialist for the uh, Snohomish School District here in Washington, alongside her role as a deaf blind specialist for the Washington Deaf Blind Program. And Kathy is a consultant to the deaf blind program here in Washington State and has 40, over 40 years of experience as a teacher, assessment specialist, principal, educational consultant with children birth to 21 with combined vision and hearing loss, including deaf blindness. There's just so much experience between the two of you, and we're so excited to tap into some of that experience, specifically around students who have combined vision and hearing loss. And then, Kathy, would you like to um, introduce yourselves a little bit and add anything that I hadn't already? Sure. Um, um, as you said, um, I hold a, a few different degrees, um, specifically um, working with students with um, low incidence disabilities um, as uh, a teacher for students of uh, with low vision and, and blindness and a uh, teacher of the deaf blind. Um, I was in the classroom for about 10 years um, working with um, students with moderate to severe impacts. Um, before transitioning to my current role in the Snohomish School District as the um, teacher of students with low vision and blindness. And then I've also worked for the Washington Deaf Blind Program since 2007, um, providing um, support to teams working with children with deaf blindness, um, and recently have um, taken on the role of uh, helping the, the um, program develop professional development. Great. That's an important role. Kathy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I came into uh, working with kids with combined vision and hearing loss uh, through a back door, like many of us do. And I started out working with deaf kids. And I noticed how frequently I had students, not only who were wearing glasses, but who glasses weren't helping them visually. And they were greatly impacted. And so that's where my interest grew. And I went back and got a master's degree in uh, vision and uh, emotional uh, disabilities. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I think what happened was I, as a teacher for 12 years, I noticed that I had to come up with different ways to connect with those students because so much of the training in that classroom for deaf children was visual. And um, and so I started looking at the fact that some of those kids had some use of the auditory that was better than I had expected when I read records. Records can sometimes deceive you both ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that is the piece that I started learning and wanted to work with those students. And I ended up becoming a principal and was able to impact more kids because of some of my background with vision, um, not just uh, the classroom teacher of the students I had. And you're now retired, but still busy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you both work with the Washington DeafBlind program. Can you tell us a little bit about that program? Well, I was a co-director with Nancy Hatfield uh, for, I'm not even sure how many years. Uh, but when I came, when I moved to Washington State, I got a job as the person on the east side of Washington who would work with students who had deaf blindness or had a combined vision and hearing loss. And so that program looks at birth to 21. They provide assistance to the families as well as the school districts when asked uh, to help figure out ways to help that student learn. And obviously, the biggest issue is communication for those students and concept development. They don't have the vision and the hearing to develop all the concepts we do because we do have vision and hearing. And therefore, it, um, it really impacts that child's ability to develop a concept and get a real sense of what something is. Um, I think the other thing um, that 
Em and I work with all the time is that these students do not learn very little incidentally, which, you know, research tells us 80 to 89 to 90 percent of what we learn is incidental. So that really puts that student at a disadvantage. Um, so the project uh, uh, assists in getting information to the families as well as the school districts. We will provide training if requested. Uh, we will provide individualized TA for that specific student because each one is so unique. I mean, I don't think I've ever met two children ever. I don't even care if they have no disabilities mm -hmm. or the same as anybody else. Exactly. So this definitely uh, speaks to this group of students. Um, and uh, we really encourage um, people to get involved and to look at what's the team that's around that student that we can work with. To just work directly with the teacher or um, the intervener, which I'll let uh, Emma say a little bit about interveners. Um, it, you know, we, we look at that and that's not enough. It has to be the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the speech and language therapist, the nurse maybe at the school, uh, the principal, the janitor, I mean, it's amazing the people that can be involved with this student as well as the family. And mm -hmm. brothers and sisters are huge. Grandmas and grandpas, if they live nearby, are huge helps for us to find out what does this child like? What doesn't he like? Um, and when I say he or she, I just mean both. Right. You're sure. speaking our language. We we love collaboration. We love that. That's what we talk about all the time. That's That's really where it needs to be. Before we talk about the intervener, because I would like to hear more about that, um, you mentioned TA, and I just want to say that's technical assistance. So if uh, a family or someone in a school district listening, perhaps, is needing support with their student who has combined vision and hearing loss, they can contact the Washington Deaf Blind Pro Program to get support. Our webpage has a request support button. Great, and we'll be sure to put that in our description. And then are you folks familiar with other states if that's um, something that people listening from other states um, can also find? Yes, there's a DeafBlind project um, in every state. Um, there are a couple states that share the information, but they're available to everybody. Great, thanks. The, the National Center on DeafBlindness um, has information if you're if you are listening from another state and, and would like to get in touch with your state deafblind program if you um, Google <laughs> National Center on Deafblindness they have some information about how you can can go about that. That's right. nationaldb.org. Thank you very much. We'll add that too. So Emma, um, what is an intervener? So an intervener is a highly trained one-on-one -on -one professional, typically a, a paraeducator somebody who has um, received training specific to strategies that are used for a child with deaf blindness. Um, the, the strategies that we use are um, distinct and, and very different. Um, I, when I went through my teacher prep program, it was for um, students. My, my first teacher prep program was for students with low incidence disabilities. And I didn't learn about any of the strategies that we, I have since learned about since, um, starting uh, uh, receiving technical assistance from the deafblind program and then and then working with them. Um, in Washington State, we have five credentialed uh, interveners, um, nationally cr credentialed interveners, and we have two about to um, to complete um, a program through Central Michigan University. So, um, it's it's an area that is growing slowly, um, but um, we're excited because it it provides the appropriate support for a student with combined impacts to vision and hearing. Wow. So what what are you looking for when you are see a student in like like the paperwork maybe has hearing loss, but then you're like, hmm, what's going on with the vision? Or the paperwork says vision loss, but you're like, wow. Feel like there's um the, the the hearing is not 
there either or whatever, right? What, what are the, what are you looking for to go? What is the relative strength? Is it vision? Is it hearing? Is it tactile? I know you're going to kind of use all of it if they have any, any vision, any hearing, any, but um, what do you, what are some of the telltale? Like, oh, I think this might be um, a dual diagnosis here. The, the first thing I do is, is reach out to the family and, and find out, you know, is, is there something I'm missing? Is that, you know, so often a, a child may have a diagnosis early on and through the years, it kind of gets lost or forgotten and isn't reflected in paperwork. So maybe by high school, it's, it's, it's not remembered that the child maybe has right. vision or hearing or both. Um, and so I, I typically start with the, the family just to do a little, um, research on, on that end. Um, sometimes it's just, I suspect something is going on. You know, mm -hmm. there's a real difference between, um, the information that we take in through our senses and being able to process that information. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we, uh, we may, uh, hear comments like, well, well, they can hear, but are they understanding, are they processing what they're hearing? And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that can be a, a different conversation. Um, we use an assessment called the use of sensory channels when determining uh, mm -hmm. what what channel is their strongest sensory channel. Um, okay. And even if a child has combined impacts to vision and hearing, it still could be that vision is their strongest sensory channel. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't, having that uh, uh, diagnosis of deaf blindness does not... Um, necessarily mean that those aren't usable senses for for the child. There's a mother of a young man who has charge and she came up with the idea of her son was in a box and we call it the box of deaf blindness. And the idea was what does he have available and how do I get him to open the box? Because I can't open the box. I can only set it up so that he will want to open that box mm -hmm. and come out and learn things. And so that's another tool that we use looking at records and asking questions about, you know, what's this child's sense of touch? Is he tactically defensive? Um, what does he, what does he do, do with his feet? Because sometimes the feet start out being much better explorers than the hands do. So we start and look at all those different senses and, and put that together so that we can start to say, okay, yes, there is some usable vision. However, here are all the conditions that have to be there for that child to be able to use that vision. And that doesn't always happen. So what do we do in the situation when all those four things aren't happening? Um, and so uh, the, the sensory channels uh, use form that uh, Emma was mentioning is one we like to use because people sometimes have the idea that this child hears more than he does because he's not comprehending and interpreting what he hears or visually. They say, oh, no, he sees everything. You know, he runs around. And I've worked with students who that's the only way they see is by running around. The minute mm -hmm. you stop them they hardly see anything. So there's so many things you have to look for in that to then figure out how is this child going to learn? How is this child gonna learn how to communicate? That mm -hmm. profile, um, that sensory profile, we'll, we'll link that, we'll find it and link it because that sounds like it could be useful for many people on the team, yeah. an SLP or an OT, that, that's really great. So what are four or five things that you've learned that are important when working with students with the combined vision and hearing loss? I think uh, for me, um, relationship. Uh, relationship is everything. If I have a relationship with the student or whoever's working with the student has the relationship, then I know um, that that child's going to be able to do the very best they can. We've set mm -hmm. that up for them. So I think relationship is way, way more vital than what I ever thought before I went into working with students with combined vision and hearing loss. Um, certainly concept development, and I mentioned that briefly before, they do not know the concepts. How do you know how big an elephant is? Well, because you see it with a man standing by it or a you know, a car next to it or something, and you get the idea that this thing, this thing is huge. 
Well, I can't bring an elephant into the classroom for the child to learn that the elephant's that big. And so mm -hmm. the concepts have to really be built and we have to think about concepts we've never thought about needing to teach because the child came to school with those concepts. And these children don't necessarily do that. Could you give some examples of how you do teach concepts? Yeah. One is um, in the beginning, there's very little use of books and pictures, obviously, because for most of the students, they're not going to see it well enough. And they may not be able to see the perspective even in the photo. And so, uh, I, you know, that's one thing I try to pay attention to, um, that there are students who can see the picture, but they do not understand what that picture is until they have the object, until the person is there, until the toy is there. And later, as that child develops the concept of what those toys are, or what a pencil is, what a crayon is, then, we can go ahead and see, gee, maybe they will see a picture of a crayon and know that's a crayon. But the issue is, is in the beginning, they don't see the, they don't see the connection at all. And so we have to do a lot of things. We have to do activities, activities with waters, water, eggs. Uh, you know, we scramble them, we hard boil them, you know, we eat them, we cut them, we, what are, all the things we do with all different kinds of eggs. We can't just do one egg and say, this is an egg, because all they're going to see is the shell, and they're going to feel a smooth shell. They're not going to feel the white and the yolk inside the egg. And so we have to do a lot of stuff um, that other people would never think about. They're busy thinking about reading and starting to recognize letters, and we're, we are wanting them to get the idea of what it is. And you're providing um, experiences to learn the language, too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think about the consistency that is required for a child with um, deaf blindness. You know, they're not, as Kathy said, not taking in incidental information in the same way someone with typical vision and hearing does. And so they're not able to anticipate what's going to happen, um, you know, in their day um, within a certain activity, how someone is going to um, interact with them, communicate with them. Um, provide prompting. So um, consistency is a, a huge piece um, for our students with um, inconsistent access to vision and hearing. Mm -hmm. Area I never thought about was, is my student available to learn? Uh, under what, what factors are there that are both internal, because many of our students have complex health needs, and the reality is, is internally, how are they doing? And are they available for learning or are they too exhausted? Um, is the medication affecting them, the meds they're on? Um, is it, uh, is it, are they too hot? Are they too cold? Um, all those things, whether or not they're internal or whether or not they're external, such as the lighting, is the lighting okay in the classroom? Um, is it too noisy for the student? Uh, all those external factors too, that I really have to pay attention to, especially when I go in to observe in a classroom and the, the class is very noisy, the students are noisy, the staff is noisy, um, and this student maybe has some usable hearing, but not in those conditions. And so how do I find a place for him to be quiet with somebody as he's learning certain things? Um, so I think the availability to learn, I pay way more attention to than I used to as a teacher. It seems like what's important with probably all of our populations, but but in this one in particular, is recognizing what is the purpose of what we're doing in this moment, right? So there's a time to do pull out to reduce all the distraction because that's what it's going to take to learn. But life doesn't happen in isolation, right? So then there's also this time in letting them experience the chaos that is life, but you're not you're not taxing the cognitive system by adding a learning a learning experience on top of that, right? So it's like looking at what what do, what are they learning? right? They're, every minute of the day that they're awake, they're learning something, right? It's like, what am I teaching when I'm doing this? What am I teaching when I'm doing that? What am I actually teaching when I'm doing this in this environment? Yeah. 
And it's like, you almost, it's almost like a lot of self-reflection as a teacher about like, if I want to teach this for them to get this concept, I need to minimize distraction for them to generalize this concept. I need to introduce some distraction, but maybe not all of it. Maybe I introduce some visual distraction, then I maybe introduce, right? So it seems like it's like this methodical way of looking out. Everything I do teaches something. Every environment they're in teaches something. How do I um, kind of do the dance of making sure that I'm providing the right environment for that learning objective? That's very well put, Brent. <laughs> Yeah. And that's a lot to think about. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And you can still forget elements. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it, you're, you're not a perfect human being. You don't, you know, you don't do everything perfectly. I mean, I've right. made so many mistakes. It's, you know, frightening. Um, I've, I've had dreams about apologizing to kids. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I didn't know more about this at oh the time. God, I taught you. so overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. And you know what? Actually, it's kind of comforting to hear that you've made mistakes, Kathy, because I know you're just such an expert in the field. And I mean, I've, I think you, you didn't, weren't you a, a instrumental in some of the modules um, yeah. created? Was that in Texas or? or? Uh, it was nationally. The NCDB actually arranged to have uh, 27 modules developed by people all over the country and actually a couple people from outside the country uh, to help uh, in interveners learn about how to be an intervener. And they're excellent. And every time I'm looking at one, I learn something. And so it's it's kind of comforting to hear that you, you didn't, you weren't born that way. And that, you know, that that we all can learn, right? That we all can learn just like and in, in, in even those modules show they'll they'll focus on like the some one very small element that I'm like, man, I never thought about that or whatever. Right. And so it's just so helpful to to look at this piece by piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to build on what Brenda said about um, what is the purpose of, of what mm -hmm. I'm teaching, but also um, what is this meaningful for the child and is it motivating for the child? Mm -hmm. right? They only learn, you know, when we're actively engaged and what is going to have us actively engaged, something that is meaningful and motivating to us. Um, and so I think early in my career, I really had to kind of dig deep and think, you know, is, is, is this meaningful for this child and, and, um, really reframe my thinking around some of the things that I, I thought were, um, important for the child to learn, but really weren't. Right. So or the way we're doing it. Like we will often talk about, are we teaching this? Or are we testing this? Is this an interaction? Um, you know, just because I said point to red, that's not helping your relationship with that child, but you said is so important, right? They've, right. they've kind of been like, okay, I'm done with you. Right. <laughs> exactly. Meaningful or motivating. So right. when you when you think about deafblind, I think about tactile systems, but I also know that like um, the basically GI Joe size of an elephant isn't actually a tactile system for elephant, is it? because of the size that it is and it doesn't yes. feel like the texture and it doesn't hold a lot of meaning. So I think sometimes we can get overzealous as SLPs and be like, oh my gosh, we're going to do a PEC system that's tactile and we're going to find the mini objects of all the things. Because they'll fit in a book. <laughs> yeah. Or, or some little, I, I remember I had a, um, almost like a fishing tackle box mm -hmm. at one point with miniatures of all the things, right? Thinking that I was like, okay, here we go. Now I have object representation if that's where the kid's at. And that might have worked for kids that were didn't have that had perfect vision and hearing and where they just needed the object. I don't know. But what do you where do you start with tactile systems? Well part of it is we have to realize that if that is that what that child wants. Like I met a little eight-year-old deafblind boy and he was going to be a weatherman on TV. That was okay. all he cared about was the weather. And you know how, you know, you talk about trying to make something touchable like the wind and forget it. You know, I mean, you really have to think about how, how do I set that opportunity up for him that he really understands what the wind means. Well, we go outside when it's windy, we go out and maybe we have a flag up and the flag is totally down because there's not one bit of wind. So the child can feel that flag and know, oh, that means there's no wind. Um, so that whole idea of 
if he likes dinosaurs, the question is, what is it about dinosaurs that is meaningful to him? Is it, tac is it tactile? Is it the touch? Is it being able to hit the rubber dinosaurs everybody buys for their kids, you know, and whack? And he'd whack anything as long as he had something to whack with, you know. And uh, you have to look at what it is, because if I start thinking about, well, gee, how do I teach? It was billions of years ago and all this stuff. He doesn't know that. So that's not what is attracting to him to dinosaurs. And, you know, so um, I think the point that you made, Emma, about how is it purposeful to him? Is it functional for him or her? That's really the issue. And then what is it about that topic that they are so fascinated by? And um, and I can go all off. I mean, I, I could have developed a whole semester on dinosaurs, but it didn't touch anything that that child cared about. So you sure. really have to watch that student. And I think observation, uh, both M and I would say observation is so crucial. And especially the observation by the teacher, the paraeducator, the people that spend the most time with the student. If the parents both work and the child comes home to grandma and grandpa, I want to talk to grandma and grandpa because they're going to know things that the parents don't know just because of that as well as the parents and the brothers and sisters. And you, if you want to find out what that child doesn't like, the brothers and sisters can tell you because they've used it to get that child away from them and leave them alone for a while too. So, sure. I, you know, I think that's it. And I think the other thing that I wanted to just say about what is important is waiting. Um, I have had to learn to count to 10 in my head, 20 in my head, 30 in my head, before I try to rephrase or, or reconstruct what we were trying to do. Um, otherwise, I, that child will never be active. He will be passive the rest of his life waiting for people. And, uh, you know, a, a good example, I'm thinking of a deafblind boy in Spokane, and um, he was so used to people asking him questions and him not initiating communication that he got to school one day and I looked at him and I thought, well, he doesn't look very good. And um, he said, Mrs. Baker does, and he said his name, do I, do I need to go home? And she said, well, do you need to go home? He said, am I sick? Mm. It was like I, he, had, he communicated through questions because he was so used to somebody always initiating everything. And so if you don't wait, you never get initiation. I think you make such a good point there. I think with learned passivity is real. And as we, when we don't wait, we create that. And when we, sometimes we are, we just think we're being helpful, but we're going through that prompt hierarchy every five seconds. What do you want to do instantly? Do you want to do this one or this one? All of a sudden it's bimodal. And then it's like no response. Yes or no. This one, like all of a sudden we've, and if they do nothing, we're going to pick one anyways. And it's been 10 seconds. Right. Um, when I'm coaching people, I usually say count to 30 just so that they're quiet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that I can, so that even if I'm going to interject with a prompt before 30, I want them to not. And then I want them to also feel what 30 seconds of wait time feels like, what it sounds like, what it looks like, because wait time also means that you are quieting your voice, you're quieting your body, you are not filling it in by saying the question again. That's not part of wait time is saying it again. You're uncomfortable, but they're getting somewhere. They're Now their wheels are turning and you can see it on their face. What is the intake of their breath? Are they feeling stressed? So we all know that when we're feeling stressed, we don't think as clearly there, you know, it just doesn't happen as, as clearly for us. And so I, I really pay attention to, gosh, did I just kick the kid over into stress mode? Mm -hmm. And now I've got to undo that before we can go ahead and do anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think stress is something um, that sometimes with some kids is very hard to pick up with other kids. It's very simple and it's very easy, but if you learn that child and you observe long enough, you will see where the signs of stress are. Mm. I'm thinking a little girl that I worked with uh, who had a vision loss and a hearing loss. 
And I would ask her a question. What I didn't know was that underneath the desk, her hand was starting to sign what she wanted to say, but she wasn't saying anything. And one day I dropped my pencil and I went to pick my pencil up and I saw her hand moving with the sign. And so the next activity we did, we sat next to each other so I could I could more easily read what she was doing, you know, and then I would slowly, you know, I'd so I'd start signing down here, you know, you start to model your students. That's another technique that I use is I model them instead of them modeling me so mm. I can see what's going on. And what does it feel like to be doing what they're doing if they do a behavior that I can't figure out why? Why are they doing that behavior? I do the behavior so I can figure out, gee, that feels kind of good or gets rid of stress or whatever. Hmm. I think that's another reason why uh, quiet wait time is so important is some of our students' communication is so subtle. And if you're just busy looking for the way you think a child might respond, they may be communicating in other ways, some of our students, it's a slight movement of a hand or a facial expression. And, um, you know, if we're too busy kind of filling that space with talk and prompting, we're missing an opportunity to reinforce some communication. I worked with an SLP thinking about the quiet wait time. I worked with an SLP who shared that one of her strategies is to count her teeth with her tongue because she can't talk during, uh, <laughs> during that. And I thought that's just such a great way to do it because I, you that know, I, I've been in this field for 28 years and I still, I, I need to sit on my hands sometimes or bite my lip because the urge is to fill the space with, with talk and prompting. And we're just, really impacting our students' ability to um, process and formulate and execute a response when we're doing that. Right. Well, and you know, that's sometimes how I find a switch site too, is if I'm talking to them and, I, and I'm I'm listing a few things that they like, I'm like, okay, I'm wondering if you want to do bubbles. And I wait. The ball. Or if you want to go outside and then one of their hand goes up, right? And you're like, oh, I wonder if I put a switch there that says that's the one because you're you naturally kind of raised your hand. And by the way, I'm doing a large movement on the screen, but honestly, sometimes it's just these like things like this, right? Sometimes right. it's just like a little finger goes up and you're like, did you see that? Did I, did, did I make that up? Like, but again, if it's under a, t a desk, then you're missing it, right? So it's like, sometimes that observation is like, especially with our kids with CP and complex bodies and they, you don't even know what's voluntary movement and what's not, but then you see these little movements, right? And you're like, huh, can I shape that to a switch site? Can I give them a way to control their environment? Because that looks like they moved on purpose. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Responding as if it is consistent to shape it into something that does become intentional. Right. And I'd so, like to go back to something you talked about, Brenda, the, it, the issue of miniatures. And I, I think that goes along too with how do you devise a communication system for a student who has a combined vision and hearing loss that works for him cognitively, conceptually, every way, physically. Um, you were just talking about, you know, would this switch even work? Would I have to have a different kind of switch because that child can't press that hard and all those things. And I think one of the things that Em and I have talked about a lot, and, I, and I'm sure both of us have talked to other people who work with kids who are deafblind, is that oftentimes what we see with communication is that somebody wants to grab an iPad and start doing something with the child immediately with the iPad. And... Um, instead of finding other ways to communicate and looking at how they communicate and shaping that communication into something that is understandable to all of us instead of bringing and putting this device in front of them. And you know, AAC um, is not just devices. It is anything you can come up with that is gonna help that child be able to communicate. So the idea of having parts of objects or the exact same kind of spoon, which will mean eat, uh, instead of a picture on an iPad that might have four 
pictures on it. And there's nothing wrong with all the communication, electronic communication systems that they've devised. They're marvelous. But I think very often for our children who are who have vision and hearing loss, that is not where you want to go, but it's easy. And as, as many things as teachers have to do in their classrooms these days, they're going to look for the easiest way. And I understand that. I would be too. But I really want to just reiterate that the idea of getting an electronic device is not necessarily where you want to start. A communication system rather than a device. Like what is the what is the best system here? And that may or may not be a high tech voice out. But I feel like Emma, you wanted to add to that. Well, it, it may also be different things. It may be to communicate one thing that where we are, um, the child is using facial expressions and to communicate something else, it may be a, a symbol or a whole object. Um, you know, we all communicate in a variety of ways. And sometimes we get so focused on, nope, we're work, we're working on this symbol or pressing this button and the child may be communicating you know, through a gesture or facial expression, yet we're, you know, kind of um, forcing the issue of using a, a device or, you know, a, a symbol system. So. And it might be that a device is something the student will have at some point for some communication, right? But um, you're saying it's, it's maybe not always where you want to start. Don't just go there because it's easy. And there's well, so many ways that you can communicate without even opening your mouth without even signing one sign. There are so many ways we communicate constantly. I mean, when you're out to dinner in a noisy restaurant, sometimes you end up doing things where you communicate with a smile or you communicate with pointing or you, co uh, you communicate with a different kind of gesture. And I think those, um, those are things we wanna look for because those are socially acceptable by anybody. And that means that we have opened and widened the number of people who could interact with this child because they have some of those social gesture skills that anybody would understand. I also think that sometimes if you go straight to high tech, the child's only success with tactile support, which actually is not independent access of communication right. and also can create some passivity and sends a message that um, I'm going to let you control my body to make to make to make choices. And I mean, I, you know, we have to think about again what is the if if they cannot access this independently, what are we creating? Are we are we creating passivity? Are we creating assist? Are we are we just do we just have an agenda that they'll touch a certain button a certain amount of times and we're going to help their hand do that, but it's not actually communication at all. And I think that's where there's a gut check on our own ob observation of like, what am I teaching? Again, everything we do is teaching something. Mm -hmm. so what am I teaching here with this high tech? And is it effective? And is it actually independent, authentic communication? Or is it something else? I'd like to share just a story of a young girl that I um, met in Arizona, and she had infant Paget's syndrome. And um, so it was like the first, this was years ago, like the first major device. So you can imagine how big this device was uh, in the beginning. And uh, everybody was so excited, so was I, uh, about this opportunity. And what we found is, by the use of that device, she started to sign more and she was more understandable for sign language because she didn't like that device in between us. Mm. And that was fascinating to me. And it was one of those things that, you know, you have those times in your life when you see something or you're with somebody and somebody says something and you go, wow, I never even thought about that. She did not want that device. She wanted to be able to look at you and and be close enough to you that she could communicate with you. And uh, so I, uh, you just reminded me of Lynette. <laughs> well, and, and a communication system that is consistently available to her, right? She can, right. She can sign when, when the need arises. Um, sometimes I see, you know, uh, children learning to use switches to indicate yes and no, but the switches aren't consistently available. So maybe an adult is placing it on the child's tray 
in the moment and the child just knows, oh, it's there. So now I hit it. And then the, and then the button goes away. And I'm always encouraging people to think about what, how, you know, is, is the child really learning that this button ha- is communicating something and has meaning, or I, I just know that when it's put in front of me, I hit the button and, um, yeah, and it goes away. We, we always try to encourage a non-tech yes and no, right. And people, you know, whatever it is for that that child may look very different, but yeah. yeah. It's also the most reliable yes, no. When you're, when you're, if your facial expression is, is yes and no, <laughs> or you know what I mean? If your body is yes and no, it, it's pretty reliable. And um, I, you know, I've had girls with Rhett that, um, that they, they um, are super smart. They spell on their devices. They do all these things. And then we put yes and no up there and they're, they're not, they're about 80%. And, and I know they know yes and no, but then, you know, they're like, oh, I don't know, maybe this smiley face is the right answer. Right. Or I'm attracted to red. So I'm going to say no. Like, you know, we don't even know sometimes why, why we have yes kids and no kids um, when, when, when we're providing that level of stimuli. So I, I do think that um, honoring the body language that is innate for that child. I, I had a kid that would always kick his right foot for yes. And the whole team wanted that to look different because it wasn't um, universal and people weren't going to know that. And you know what? No, that was his, that was his yes. And, you know, he's going to kick you <laughs> if you make him do something else. And it's like, you get to be you. That That's the, that's your, that's the way you've always done it. That's where, that was a voluntary movement from the beginning. Like you were saying, Kathy, sometimes those feet, especially in those little birth to three kids, mm-hmm. they can do all kinds of things with their feet. And, and you see um, people wanting to shape like, well, we're not going to use your feet. We're not going to. I had a device user that used his toes his whole life. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had the device put down by his, by his feet. We didn't, uh, we couldn't believe he could even see it. It didn't matter. He used his big toe. I mean, this was in Seattle. He never wore a sock or a shoe on his right foot. And all of his communication was with his toe. And, you know, he was an adult when, by the time I ran into him and, and he was like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. This is it, you know? So it's like, also just kind of honoring that this is what you're, this is what you feel like you have the most control over. So this is Mm -hmm. where, this is what we should begin to look at the AAC system through um, an access method that you feel like you have the most control. Exactly. That that control is so huge. If we all think about our lives, we want the control is the issue of it, you know? And uh, my husband and I would drive and um, it was hard for me not to be a backseat driver. And it's not that he was a terrible driver. It just wasn't the way I wanted him to do it. You know, and it's like, this is stupid. You know, one day I, I just, I looked at him and I said, that's just really stupid of me. <laughs> and he said, oh, good. I'm glad you got that. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he needed the control, but I wanted it. So we all want the control. And to respond to the child's need for control by just being able to kick his foot, you know, it's as long as everybody knows that that's what that means. What, what does it matter? Of course, we want our our students' communication to be understandable to as many people as possible. But there are ways to share that, like developing a, a communication dictionary. When the child kicks her right leg, that means yes. When they do, you know, this body movement or make this facial expression, this is how we are reading that and responding to that. Um, there, there are methods to to ensure that people are understanding um, the child's communication. Right. And even identifying that with the kid, like, listen, every time it looks like you're saying, yes, you're kicking your foot. So you know what, F- moving forward, I'm going to take that as a yes. And if you do nothing, I'm going to take that as a no. Maybe you don't have a movement for no, but we're going to take that as an answer too. No response is a pretty loud response if you're paying attention, right? Right. right. So, But you have to be, you have to be metacognitive. You have to be out loud about this is what I'm seeing. And this is what I'm interpreting that as. And I'm going to put words to that movement so that we can begin to consistently identify that movement as this word. Sometimes what I've done, if I've acknowledged that uh, with the child, then I might be doing this is yes. And your foot kicking, they're the same. Mm-hmm. It's yes. 
Okay. And, and I've watched children eventually change over to the sign that mm -hmm. I kept presenting to them because I knew they could do that sign too. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes their hands don't work well enough to do a sign and that's not an option. We, we talk a lot about younger kids just because I think you're beginning to work on the communication and there's a lot of excitement with emergent communicators, but do you often work with older students who are deafblind and what does that look like? What type of things are you working on? Emma mentioned earlier that sometimes by the time they're in high school, nobody knows that he has a hearing loss because mm. he's not deaf. And, you know, there are those problems because then you're, you know, you've been not being able to use something that you had available for all those years. Uh, and so sometimes it's a question of nobody's done anything with communication because this child can't communicate. And, um, you know, there is no such thing as can't communicate. We are just not watching is the reality mm. of it. And mm. so I think with high school students, sometimes it's difficult because you may be starting down where the two and three-year-olds are because nobody did anything for all those years. They were babysitting him. They didn't have a clue about what they needed to do. Uh, nobody, you know, he, he couldn't sign because he's blind. So, you know, we can't sign. Well, did anybody try tactile signing? You know, all those things. And what I saw was, especially I'd come in and the kids were maybe middle school age. And I said, well, have you tried signing? Oh yeah, they tried that for a year. And I said, so if I talk to you for a year, whatever you learn in a year, you're going to look competent. Well, no, not necessarily. I said, yeah, you didn't give enough time. And so people start all over again when they leave schools because somebody didn't do enough and long enough in the first place. We see that and all so, the time with AAC as well, AAC systems. So like, well, they tried this one language system. It didn't seem to work very well. So we're switching to a new one. Mm -hmm. And they need time and experience with it. Most of us took Spanish 101 in, in, you know, a year of Spanish in high school or something. And yeah. how fluent are we, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Donde está la, el baño, you know? Like, where's the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> Kathy worked with a, a colleague of mine that um, she and I went through the low incidence program at the University of Washington, and she talked about her first year teaching. Um, she had a student that um, didn't have a communication system. So she said, you know, here she is fresh out of college and she's throwing all the tech that she knows how to at him. And there was just no progress made. And so she went and reviewed his records and was like, well, he's not hearing and seeing <laughs> She didn't realize that, again, talking about uh, that information getting lost along the way. And um, so then she worked with Kathy and they developed a, a tactile system for him. And um, I think it was in, in high school, maybe his last year of middle school, but high school, by the time he graduated, he had 50 symbols that he was using consistently. Um, I think about how much that opened up his world. One of my favorite stories about him that I, I tell frequently, but it's just so touching, is that at, at home, he would um, uh, scoot on the floor to get around the house. And he uh, scooted over to his dad one day with a, a symbol for um, his tube feeding. And he handed it to his dad, and but shook his head. And um, what he was really requesting was the uh, TV. And his symbol for that was the rubber buttons from a remote control, but they had fallen off on, on the card. And so he was looking for another way to communicate this. And so he handed, you know, he handed it to dad, but shook his head. Dad was feeling the, the G tube rubber and dad kind of pieced it together and said, Oh, do you want to watch TV? And the student, his sign for yes is a very emphatic, you know, clap. And that's what he did. And so he just, his, his problem solving within that system was amazing too. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's just the, the power of finding the right um mode for for a student right. and and <laughs> ensuring that you know we're considering all these access pieces you know is yeah. a device and maybe it is maybe a, an iPad or dedicated communication device is is visually and auditorily accessible but maybe it's not 
So, you know, for our children, are they, are they pressing a button and not getting that auditory confirmation of what I just hit, or are they even able to perceive two dimensional, um, you know, pictures or let alone icons, things that, you know, I think about, uh, the line drawing symbols for, you know, water fountain and, that representing drink or thirsty. And I think that how many people see that style of water fountain and know that that means thirsty or drink, you know, there's, there's a right. lot of skills and concepts that go into um, being able to use something like that. Maybe each of you can just tackle one myth that you just feel like if you leave this podcast today and we just blow one of these things out of the water, what, what do you think people need to just stop approaching it that way stop thinking about that way stop using that vocabulary what, what are you thinking as, as a myth that just needs to get busted i think that some if a child isn't using symbolic communication that they're not communicating going back mm -hmm. to what we were talking about earlier look look stop and and quietly observe your child and and or your student and see how are they responding um and and document those things mm -hmm. have conversations with the people that are interacting with the child because uh, our our children are very consistently communicating we just need to um be reading it mm. i definitely agree with you emma i think for me is um uh when I worked at the Arizona School for the Deaf and Blind years ago, uh, we had to show some legislators around and they were talking about how sorry they felt for the children who were deaf and blind and everything. And um, and I looked at him and he said, how do you do this? And I said, because I don't see the deaf and blind. I see there's a child in front of me first. And I think that's the piece that Actually, almost everything we've been talking about is about looking at the individual and mm -hmm. seeing what the individual needs, seeing what the individual understands and wants to understand. Um, and I, uh, I, I just think if you think this is just a child or a student, however old they are, this is just a person just like me. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that is the first thing for me mm. that the, the myth that this is some poor person who, you know, unfortunately had to have this happen to them mm. is one of the, the most horrible things that we do to kids. Mm. Mm. And if we feel like that's what they are, then we shouldn't be in this field. Mm -hmm. We should be doing something that, else. That individual piece has definitely been a thread throughout all these conversations we've had about vision, just looking and communication, honestly, all of these series, but looking at people individually and, and respecting who they are. Diagnosis is not, is not the person. Right. You know? I mean, Brenda, your story about the little boy with the right leg, the right foot kicking that I'll remember that story forever because that's <laughs> such a great example of not trying to change somebody and make it quote, more understandable to everybody else. And as you said, Emma, there's a communication dictionary available. Just make it and people will know what that means. Yeah. Yes. We don't have the time to waste on doing stuff so that they look like everybody else. And I had a parent of a deafblind child say when he was about four, she said, I don't want my son to be a second class hearing seeing person. I want him to be a first class deafblind person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're right. We don't have the time to waste and we don't have the time to waste to doing things that aren't meaningful for those kids, exactly. for all of our kids. Yeah. yeah. Before we wrap up, is there anything that you guys wanted to share? Anything you're like, I wish they would have asked me this or any resources that you think would be helpful that you haven't already mentioned? You've already mentioned a lot. Well, I think the modules for sure. Um, I There are two books that um, I've read with children who are not deafblind um, to help them understand. And those two books are Can You Feel the Thunder? Mm -hmm. uh, which is a great one about a brother and sister's relationship, and she's deafblind. And then the other one is Child of the Silent Night. And that's a story about Laura Bridgman, um, who actually years and years before Helen Keller ever showed up, Laura was one of the first deafblind kids worked with. Um, and, and that's an interesting story. And then um, I was telling Emma that there are three triplets who are deafblind, 
And um, the last name of the family is Dunn, D-U-N-N. And there are some videos on the internet that show those three triplets, the only triplets in the world that anybody knew who were all deafblind and all wow. the different level of deafblindness. And that's pretty interesting because they bring up issues that we've been talking about, but they bring up other issues from a more personal family perspective. And I, I think I think sometimes uh, we forget what it's like for the family. Um, and partially because we can't imagine it if we don't have a child with disabilities ourselves. Um, I can only imagine, and I know that that's not gonna be the same as what each family is feeling. Um, I just have a lot of respect for families and pay a lot of attention to them because they they have understandings none of us have. So true. Thank you for those resources. Emma, mm -hmm. was there anything else you wanted to add? Our, our website, um it has a lot of great uh, video topics and information on um, different strategies that we use with children with deaf blindness. So I can um, provide you with um, that. Maybe that's something that you guys could uh, definitely share a link to. We will for sure. We'll have all these links in the notes um, on this podcast. And we really appreciate talking with you guys. It's, it's just that's been a joy and so, so fun to hear your experiences and, and learn more. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing. It's always all great it. talking to you guys. This is always fun. I always learn stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, we learn from you. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. The contents of this podcast were developed under contract with the Washington Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, U.S. Department of Education, and administered by Central Washington University. However, those contents did not necessarily represent the policy of the OSPI and CWU, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal and state government.